And that leads to the last announcement, which is what we talked about last week in Deuteronomy chapter 6, is we're taught, we talked about loving God with all that we have. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and we, we went through the membership covenant. And one way we saw last week that we grow in our love, how we can love the Lord, is by educating our kids and educating them to love the Lord too. And so we saw that it's about repeating, right? That we don't just educate once a week. Okay, Sunday school, as great as that is, is not, it does not do everything. Because we've been told from God's Word to repeat consistently and constantly as much as we can during the week. Parents are given that first responsibility. That's from God's Word. All right, it's not the church's responsibility. It's the parents. But grandparents, uncles, aunties, fellow church members, we are responsible to help parents and also to help them teach the kids of the church. So it's not, it's parents first, but it's not only the parents. Hopefully that makes sense. Because we, we do know, right, that the world is discipling our kids. Our society, our culture is repeatedly doing what? It's bombarding our young folks about life and love and meaning and purpose and joy. So either we can show and tell our kids that God deserves first priority in our lives, or the world will slowly and surely enchant and entice little hearts and minds that we don't need to love God anymore. That's the world we live in. And when we educate our kids that loving God with all that we have is what is best for our life, then we are also, what, seeking their salvation. We want them to know God, and we want them to know Him more. And when we do that, that's an encouragement to our hearts as well. Now, this morning, we're going to go through the next section of the membership covenant, which is section E. So let's read section E together. It'll be on the screen. In addition, we commit to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating beverages during all church activities, to use our influence to combat the abuse of drugs, and the spread of all forms of sexual immorality condemned by the Bible, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. All right. And so I hope today's verses in 1 Peter chapter 2 will match well with what we just read. So to honor the reading of God's Word, and God's Word is imperishable, living and enduring. Let's stand, if you don't mind. And as you stand, I'm going to switch mics. First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. So the Apostle Peter wrote the, this to the believers, to a, a group of believers in churches, and it's also for us today. It says this, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now, this past week, I like to read the news every day. I read a news story about a family that decided to go off the grid. You know what that term means, going off the grid. Like, you don't want 
You just, you just don't want to be with civilizations. And this news story, so this is true, because it's in the news, two sisters in Colorado decided to go live in the Rocky Mountains, live off the land, like just be away from everybody else. So this meant that they ditched their smartphones, they didn't want to use the internet, they just said no electronic technology. We're just going to live off the land. We're going to live in the mountains of Colorado. They wanted to separate themselves completely from human civilization. They wanted to be left alone. And they had one more person join them in this this adventure. The 14-year-old son of one of these sisters. So almost a year ago, August 2022, these three people, these two ladies in their early 40s and a 14-year-old boy, teenager, dropped off pretty much all of their possessions with their stepsister in Colorado Springs, and then they headed up to the mountains of Colorado. So anyone, has anyone been in the Rocky Mountains? It's, it's really beautiful. Sadly, this family of three died in the mountains. They just found their bodies for all these months, and now there's an investigation to figure out how they passed. So people are speculating. Either they were attacked by a bear, or maybe a mountain lion got them, or there were wolves out in the area, or maybe they starved because they didn't, you know, they ran out of food, or because the winters get brutal up there and lots of snow, they maybe the winter weather won against them because they only built a tent. They didn't even have a shelter. So no electricity, no running water, no heating. They're out there. Okay, the natural question to ask is why? Right, well, why did this mom with a teenager decide, I mean, I guess she's pulling him out of school. Why did she decide to take her son and her sister into the wild where there is no electricity, heating, running water, no air conditioning? Here's what a newspaper article said about this mom. I find it fascinating, so it'll be on the screen. <laughs> The story of the Vance sisters and of a mother's effort to protect her son from society has threaded into a prevalent social narrative that the best way to deal with uncertainties in the world is to detach from it. Becky, a single mother, was afraid of the influence the world would have on her son. She thought she was saving her son and her sister by going off and being by themselves and not letting the world influence them. Their stepsister, Travella Jara, commented, My elder sister Becky had become fearful of the way the world was going. It wasn't going the way she wanted it to be or the way it should. And honestly, I'm with her on that. It isn't. Big time. There's more shootings, hate crimes. COVID is pretty much what broke the camel's back. Everyone felt the atmosphere change. People changed, the economy changed, politics changed, everything changed. They didn't like it, especially Becky. I think many people can relate to this mom. She didn't like how the world was going. She looks at the world, I don't like it. She was afraid, being a mom, that her son would be influenced badly by the world. And so she believed that the wise option was what? Live away from the world. Find a place in the world where you're by yourself, you're free, free from bad influences. But sadly, her good intentions ended in a tragedy. Before we criticize this mom for living with foolish wisdom, like, what a fool, why would you do that? Maybe we feel that way sometimes, like this mom. Because we don't like how politics is going or how the economy is going or how just how our life, lives are going. And so we just want to just get out of here. We just want to separate from this world. And maybe then for us Christians, we feel a tug in our hearts that we want to leave this world. I just want to get out of here. We, we want to live where there is no danger. We, we want to protect our children and ourselves from evil influences because there are evil influences out there. And, you know, we wouldn't be the first Christians in history who thought this way. 
Because history, Christian history, is full of stories of monks going out into caves or going out into the desert by themselves. The idea was, hey, if I go away from all of these sinners, then I will sin less. If I live by myself, then no one will influence me badly. I will be okay. Even today, there are some Christians who say that churches and Christians should just move away from society. You know, society's going bad. So these sisters and brothers claim that the wise way to live is to live away from the world. So maybe for those of us here, let's all go up to the Angeles National Forest, pitch some tents. We're going to live separately. Because why stay in the society when the society is corrupt, evil, and against Jesus? Right? Why? Why stay? Why stay when you could be influenced, our children could be influenced, and then we would all stop believing in God? Now, for the Christians and churches that Peter is writing to in 1 Peter, they were facing similar challenges. The society, the culture didn't like that they were Jesus followers, and they didn't feel like they were at home in their country. And so if you don't feel like you're a citizen of your country, you are what? You are, as it says in verse 11, a stranger. You're an exile. You're a foreigner. And you know, that's a fact for all Christians. We are all exiles. So from the very first verse of 1 Peter, Peter writes this, to those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, modern-day Turkey. So these Christians, even back then, didn't feel like they were home. But the Apostle Peter reminded these believers and also reminds us that we have so much in Jesus Christ. So if we go to verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 2, so if you look in our Bibles, this is what he writes. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, sisters and brothers, this truth is the same for us today. We are chosen. We are a holy nation. We are God's people who have received mercy. Amen? And because we are all of this in verses 9 and 10, and we are also exiles and strangers, as verse 11 says, how then should we live in a world that seems to be going the wrong way? How should we live in this world? Well, we're going to remember anything. Let's remember this. Live wisely in the world. Live wisely in the world. So verse 12 at the beginning says this. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. So living wisely means that you and I, as believers, have good and honorable conduct, as it says, among the Gentiles. Okay, who are the Gentiles? Well, here, it's not referring to literally non-Jewish people. Here in verse 12, it means it's talking about all the unbelievers in the world. So we as Christians must live with wisdom. We should live with beauty. We should live with goodness. And we need to live with honor in this world as we interact with unbelievers in this world. This means that we shouldn't go off and run into the mountains or into the hills and run away from society. We shouldn't shun the world and say, talk to my hand, go away from me. We shouldn't think that other people are more infected with sin because they're not Christian and we are, and if we're around them, we're going to catch the sin infection virus from them. No, we shouldn't think that way. And we shouldn't think, okay, I'm just going to give up and just do whatever culture tells me. You know, whatever Hollywood says, I should just follow. No, wise living, as it says here, means that we will interact with people who do not believe in Jesus. Wise living means that we are part of this world, but we don't belong to this world. And as our church membership covenant says, this is our testimony to the world. So, it says, we commit to walk circumspectly in the world. Now, to walk here doesn't mean we literally are walking. No, to walk means to live. 
And circumspectly is basically an SAT word for thoughtful wisdom. So for those of us who are members, right, we are, if we're members of this church, we are called to live wisely in the world. Now, does it seem like this world is going the wrong way? Anyone? Probably, yeah. All right, our society, our culture, especially here in America and Western Europe, seems to be drifting away from God's word. Does it not? And when we look out at the world, we wonder, man, this world, man, it's pretty bad. For example, saw on the news that the Methodist church down the street on Washington Boulevard, I'm sure you've seen it, they had a $15,000 cross stolen this past week. You see that in the news? So it's a sad sight when people are breaking into churches and stealing crosses. Like, whoa. And then when I saw this news story about St. James United Methodist Church, which is just, just down the street from us, I started thinking about our church, Living Rock Church. I started thinking about our safety and our security. Do we have anything worth $15,000 that someone can just break in and steal? I hope not. I hope we have good security. Okay, but then does this mean, okay, if people are breaking into churches, busting churches, destroying churches, does this mean we should live with anger? Urgh, those people. We should be cynical. Like, oh, these people, they should just go to hell. No, should we stop caring about our world because of how sinful it is going? No. We still need to live in this world. And as verse 12 tells us, we need to live wisely. Here's another couple of verses that tells us how to live. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Pay careful attention then to how you walk or live, not as unwise people, but as what? Wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And what's the Lord's will? Well, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it's to live wisely in this world. This is our commitment as a church family together. And this is our testimony before the world. Okay, so then how do we live wisely in the world? I mean, what does it look like to live as wise people who follow Jesus Christ? Well, our church covenant, we read earlier, gives us four ways. So here's number one. I'll ask it in a form of a question. How is our behavior? How's our behavior? So back to the covenant. It says this, we commit to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment. Deportment is another SAT word. It's just a fancy word for behavior. Maybe in the future we will rewrite our church covenant to have less SAT words. Our, so our behavior, as we just read here, should be just and fair. Our behavior should be faithful. Our behavior should be authentic. And we should commit to exemplary and excellent behavior. Our behavior as Jesus followers will show over time whether we are living wisely in this world. There, there's no middle ground here. My, my behavior is the fruit of what's coming out from my heart. So if I desire to live wisely in the world, if I want to live with honorable conduct among people who do not believe in Jesus Christ, then my behavior will reflect my desires. I think we can agree that it's not a great testimony when unbelievers see Christians as dishonest scammers. Right? It's not a good thing when we, you know, we diminish the gospel when our behavior is ugly, when people see our ugly behavior. We become weak witnesses for Jesus when our reputation is not sweet, but sour. Okay, so what does excellent behavior look like? Well, we have an example here in 1 Peter. So verse 13, submit to every human authority because of the Lord whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. 
okay? What is included in every human authority in verse 13? Well, it includes national governments that have emperors or kings or presidents or prime ministers. It includes state and local governments that have governors or mayors or city councils or like LA County, a board of supervisors. There's also the authority of law enforcement with sheriffs and CHP and police officers. There's also authority in the home with parents and guardians. And there's also authority in the church. And all of these human authorities exist, as it says in verse 13, because of the Lord. So we are told by the Bible to submit as long as the submission does not God's word. This is excellent behavior that reflects living. Because if my behavior is evil, if my conduct is without honor, then I will probably face some type of punishment from the government authorities. Now, in the country of Israel this year, there have been huge protests against the government. People are just, ah, government. Why? Many protesting because the current prime minister is promoting certain policies. They've already passed a new law. So a lot of people in the country are happy. I'm going to protest. You know, as good Israeli citizens, they are exercising their political rights and freedoms of protesting and demanding change or demanding things don't be changed. Right? And that's okay. But when I've been reading these stories, I've read also that a few folks in Israel have started to say that they will stop paying their taxes until they get exactly what they want from the government. And I'm thinking, what? Stop paying my taxes until the government does exactly everything that I want? Anyone want to try that here? Right? Pasadena, L.A. County, United States? Should we stop paying our taxes until every government in this country does exactly what we want as Christians? Okay, that sounds nice in theory, but you know that is what? Foolish behavior. I mean, it, one, it goes against God's word because the Bible tells us in Romans 13, you got to pay your taxes. It also goes against the law. The law tells us that if you're a citizen or a permanent resident, you must pay taxes to live in this country. And you know, it's also unwise living because we don't change the world by revolting against government authority. No, as it says here, we what? Submit, we support, we live wisely as good citizens. Because if we shouldn't, then all of our brothers and sisters in China, mainland China, should then do what? They should start a rebellion against the communist government there. And we should remember that the believers here in 1 Peter, the government at that time was the Roman Empire that persecuted and destroyed, tried to destroy Christians, and Christians had no legal rights at that time. But Peter tells them, tells us to do what? Submit. So church family and friends, how do we behave when it comes to politics and culture? How do we talk about our government leaders, whether or not we voted for them? If our social media posts, so if I use social media, right, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and pretty much the majority of my posts are about owning, owning the liberals, you know, those liberals, or maybe on the other side, you know, I can't believe those MAGA conservatives, oh my gosh, blah, 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 they're destroying our country. If that is what people see, our family and friends see what we post, social media, if that's what we talk about the most, do they think that we really love Jesus with all we have, if that's all we talk about? Maybe more importantly, how is our, how is our behavior toward our bosses and our supervisors if we work? Do we show proper respect by submitting to their authority even when they are bad jerks? Or are we known as difficult employees and lazy workers? Let's be people who submit well at work. Let's be a good testimony with our behavior. Let's live wisely in our world. Philippians chapter 2 tells us this. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, 
children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world. All right, number two. How is our heart? How is our heart? The covenant says, as we commit to walk circumspectly in the world, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive Next year, the Summer Olympics will be in the city of, anyone know? Paris. So I'm wondering, maybe the Rainer family might go there next summer to practice their French. We'll see. Okay, the current plan for Paris, the Olympics, is they want all the swim competitions to be in the river there, the river Seine. Okay, there's a problem with that plan. Why? Since 1923, swimming in that river has been banned by the city because of pollution. One retired newspaper editor in that city even said he would never swim in that river, even you put a gun to him. I would not swim in that river. So the city, before the Olympics, is doing what? They are spending well over a billion dollars to cut the pollution. That's a lot of money for a yucky mess. But you know, rivers and lakes aren't the only places where pollution can exist. Our hearts can become polluted as well. And then this anger that might fester in our hearts spills out from our tongues. So James chapter 3 says this, With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. I think this is common sense to all of us, even to our kids here this morning. If I habitually gossip, tattle, slander, verbally harass and abuse others, my heart probably, my heart is probably polluted with bitterness and anger, and then I will not probably be living with wisdom. Days, a lot of people use the word toxic, if you've ever heard that word, talking about people who talk and act in a way that pollutes others. So toxic people, toxic people pollute workplaces, toxic people pollute families, toxic people pollute hearts. And just like pollution can flow from a river into the ocean, my toxic words and anger won't just damage me. No, I will damage my testimony for Christ, and the cleanup for that might be expensive for a long time. So if I'm working, or if I'm in school, how do I treat my coworkers, my classmates, my clients, my customers? Am I a toxic polluter, or am I a clean encourager? If I am retired, right, or if I'm not working these days, do I spend my time blessing others in Jesus' name? Or am I known as a person who curses and criticizes and complains behind people's backs? Our hearts and tongues will show how wise or unwise we are living in this world. Brothers and sisters, let's not be a polluting church. Let's be a church that refreshes one another with our words. Amen. Colossians chapter 3 says this, But now, put away all the following anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. All right, number three. How do we exercise our freedom? How do we exercise our freedom? So the covenant says this. We commit to walk circumspectly in the world, to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating beverages during all church activities, to use our influence to combat the abuse of drugs and the spread of all forms of sexual immorality condemned by the Bible. Now, when my sister was in college one summer, she had the opportunity to do a study abroad trip in Europe. She actually was in Paris. And for her, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to take classes while traveling throughout Europe with a bunch of classmates. And later, after a trip, she's telling the rest of the family this. And what was interesting was when when Sunday came along, because she was there for at least two months, whichever country she was in, 
on a Sunday morning when people would wake up, some people would sleep in, while most of her classmates would then go out and they, they wanted to have drinks, even though they had drinks the night before, they wanted to drink some more on Sunday morning, my sister would start looking for a nearby church to attend the Sunday worship service. So she would try to look for a church. And if she couldn't find a Protestant church, what did she do? She went to a Catholic one and read her Bible during the Mass. In the first month or so, she just went by herself. You know, people would ask, where are you going? I'm, you know, I'm going to go to church. But then later, for the last couple of weeks, a couple of her classmates actually went with her. They joined her. Why? Did she tell them, you better go with me or else? Or did she tell all of her classmates, you guys are all pagans? Right? Repent. No. During their whole time together, classes and traveling, her behavior, her words were such a good influence that she invited people to join her, and a couple of them said, okay, we'll join you. Let's go. Now, I don't think any of them ended up believing in Jesus Christ and repenting of their sins and all that, but for sure they respected my sister's desire to worship Jesus in Europe. She exercised her freedom in Christ to be what? A good influence to those who are around her. Now listen to what 1 Peter tells us here. So verse 11 and then verses 15 and 16. Verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires to wage war against the soul. And then verse 15, for it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Verse 16, submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. So sisters and brothers, we have been given the greatest freedom in this life. It's the freedom from sin through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the freedom of living with the deepest joys and happiness and purpose and pleasure in this life. It is the freedom to live wisely in this world that Jesus Christ has given to us. So the question then becomes, what will we do with this freedom? Because we can abuse the freedom that we have, and we can use our freedom as a cover-up for evil, as verse 15 says, or verse 16, excuse me. Or we can use our freedom to influence others. The reality is that every single one of us in this chapel, every single one of you watching online, every single person is an influencer. Do you know that? You don't have to have Instagram or TikTok. You don't need to be a celebrity. If I am a Christian exile, I am an influencer who has freedom. Either I can point people to Jesus Christ and all of his beauty and grace and his goodness, or I can, what, push people away from Jesus through my words and my actions. I think I've mentioned this before, that I know someone who is a chaplain up in the Seattle area. He works at a homeless shelter. He's a chaplain there. And this brother and his family, when I visited them a few years ago, they asked me to pray with them for their next-door neighbors. Because after they moved into their house, this Christian family, this couple got to know a couple who were their next-door neighbors. And after a few times of inviting each other to their homes for dinner or just to have coffee, something interesting happened. This is what my friend was telling me. The neighbor, the husband, on his own, separately told my friend, the chaplain, hey, what's the secret to your marriage, to your family? And then at the same time, the wife was talking to my friend's wife, hey, what's the secret to your marriage and your family? Okay, why are they asking that? Because the neighbors saw how my chaplain friend and his wife related to each other, and they saw how my friend and his wife raised their sons. What's going on here? This Christian family was exercising their freedom in Christ to be a good influence. Now, sisters and brothers, is there a way 
that we can exercise our freedom that we have today to influence someone towards Jesus? Is there someone that me, myself, or my family, that we can invite for lunch, or dinner, or coffee, or go hang out somewhere at the beach? Because when we do good, as verse 15 says, we will silence foolish ignorance. And then we are living with wisdom in the world. Matthew chapter 5 says this, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. All right, lastly, number four. Are we living for Christ? And this is what the covenant says. We commit to walk circumspectly in the world and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. And then our last verse, verse 17, says this. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So when we live for Christ, we want to advance his kingdom. When we live with wisdom in this world, we will, as it says, we will honor everyone. We will love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we will fear God. And then his kingdom will continue to grow. All right, but, but why? All right, why, why should we care about all this? Why am I talking about all of this today from First Peter? Well, here's the reason. Live wisely in the world because or so that people see God as good and beautiful. Verse 12, let's go back to it, says this. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Now, if you are not a Christian this morning, you need to know that God is good and beautiful. God is great. And the good works that we as Christians try to do is not to show that we are amazing and awesome and great. No, no, no. None of us are. We are all sinners and evildoers, just like you, non-Christian friend. But the good news of Christianity says what? That Jesus Christ is the amazing, perfect, beautiful one. He owns every right as the ultimate authority in this universe to punish us and our evils and our sins forever. And we might be thinking, okay, how is that good news? No, that is good news because God has every right to do this, but God did not abuse his freedom. Jesus did not abuse his freedom as God. No, Jesus, he says, as the Bible says, gave us mercy from his heart. His perfect behavior and his good works reflect his love. And he showed perfect love when he died on the cross for sinners like us and you. And then the good news is that he rose again. And as the Bible says here, that he will come back for a final visit. And on that final day, this is for all of us, either I will glorify him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I will have fear and all before him. Or I will glorify him when he punishes my sin forever. But the key is faith. Faith. Do you believe? Do we believe? Will I follow Jesus Christ? Now, for those of us who believe today, Right, we say we believe in Jesus. We say we want to follow Jesus. Okay, let's be honest with ourselves this morning. We, sh we shouldn't tattle or tattle lies to ourselves or to one another. The reality is, is living with wisdom, is this easy? No, it's difficult, right? So maybe, right, if I think about even myself, we start the week. Okay, I went to church on Sunday. Okay, Monday, I'm going to live with wisdom during the week. Okay. Or I started the summer, I'm going to live with wisdom. I started the year. And what happens? Things start happening. You get frustrated. You wake up not well. Things happen at work. And so we start living in a way that's unwise. 
And then we realize towards the end of the week, man, this is hard. I don't want to, it's hard to live with wisdom as a Christian. And then people look at me, and then my kids wonder, hey, I spoke ill to my spouse or to my grandkids. So I think maybe this isn't worth it. Maybe we should be like that family and just go out to the mountains and just run away from this world. Like, why should we? Let's just quit our jobs. Let's just live like hermits. Right? Just live. Why should we? Man, it's hard. If we're honest, living in this life is hard. Right? We live near Hollywood. We think oh, all these influences. Um, we want to protect our kids. But here's an encouragement from 1 Peter as to why we don't have to live that way. Chapter 2, verse 20. For what credit is there if when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. For you are called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. So Jesus lived with perfect wisdom for us sinners. So even though every day we do not live with wisdom, Jesus does, because he's our example. He suffered in our place. He sacrificed his life for us. And then when we do not feel like we want to live with wisdom, Jesus tells us what? Follow his example. Because he removed our sins, and he tells us, hey, live for righteousness. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, that is good good news today. That's the best news for us and for this world. Titus chapter 2, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse us, cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. Amen. Now, as we do once a month, I want us to spend a few minutes, maybe about 10 minutes, to share and pray together. So if we can go to the next slide. For about 10 minutes, if we can partner up with someone, someone that we don't live with, let's just spend some time sharing and blessing one another by praying for each other. Yeah, Father, Father, we thank, thank you for this, this opportunity. opportunity. Father, help, help us, us to, to live, live wisely in the world. Lord, help us to be salt and light. Father, you've given us so much privilege and opportunity. Even if we in this season are feeling like we're tripping and falling, because of our own sins or the sins of others or just with uh, physical difficulties or other difficulties. Father, help us just trust that you are good and faithful, that if Christ endured so much sacrifice for us, we can continue on in faith with joy, to live with wisdom, to be good citizens and to be good influencers to others in this world. Lord, empower us, guide us. In Jesus' name we pray.